One of my favorite hobbies is cooking, and uh, I like to cook uh, for a lot of different reasons, but sometimes it just sort of helps you to get away and, and focus on one thing. I like take, taking one thing or a bunch of things and creating something with it, and so cooking to me is a little bit more than just getting a pre-made meal and zapping it in the microwave. I like to uh, create something new, and usually when I cook, it's either just for myself for lunch or it's for family dinner. Uh, but sometimes, you know, if you make a meal, there's something more going on than simply providing something for people to eat. Uh, there's, there's a meaning, um, more of a purpose behind the meal. Maybe you have a special guest coming over or you have a big announcement that you want to make, and so you make a special meal for that. Um, Jesus made meals. A lot of people don't realize this, um, but Jesus himself prepared some meals, and of course the most famous meal that Jesus prepared or really had prepared uh, by giving orders to other people was the Last Supper. Um, but the Last Supper itself wasn't actually the Last Supper that Jesus ate. It was sa- simply the last thing that he had before he died, the last meal that he shared with his disciples before his death. But of course you know that Jesus rose from the grave, and even after he rose from the grave, on occasion, Jesus had food. And at least on one occasion, Jesus prepared the food. He was the cook, he was the host. And on this occasion, we're going to read about this in John chapter 21. I invite you to take your Bible and turn there. Usually, when you have a dinner after a hard day of work, you know, it's, it's what we typically call dinner time. It's, you know, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, something like that. And uh, you come home from a hard day of work, and, and it's early in the evening, and you have dinner together with the family or per, perhaps by yourself, and, and uh, you get ready for the next day. Um, but if you work the night shift, things are a little bit different because what do you do? Do you fix breakfast? Because uh, that's, that's the meal time. Really, And so uh, that's what happened with Jesus and seven of his disciples. These disciples had been working all night, and Jesus prepared breakfast for them, except they're at the lake. And when you're at the lake, the food that nature most readily provides is fish. And so I invite you to join me as we look at John chapter 21, when Jesus prepared fish for breakfast. And if you found... John chapter 21 and verse 1, here's what we read. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again. That means he made himself uh, visible again after his resurrection. He became manifest again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. And so they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. And if you're a fisherman, you've been there. Verse 4, But when the day now was breaking, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? Now, so the disciples are in the boat. It's been a long night of fishing. No luck, as they say. No fish that they've caught. And they, say, they see this figure out on the shore. It's about, we'll learn in a minute, it's about 100 yards away, about the length of a football field away. And they can't make out exactly who it is, but this uh, person on the shore, and we know from the narrative that it's Jesus, he calls out to them, and he says something sort of strange. He gives them a clue as to who it is. He calls them children. Now, that's sort of weird for a group of grown men to be called children unless that's their mom or dad. Uh, calling them that from the shore. But these men were all, except for two of them, had uh, different parents, and so it wouldn't be anyone's mom or dad on the shore. And, but, but back in that day, there was one other instance or one other scenario where someone might call a group of grown men children. And it was a rabbi who might have some disciples. 
And the rabbi would typically call his disciples children because they're disciples. They're not full-grown rabbis yet. They haven't learned all the ways of being a rabbi. And so the teacher, the rabbi, might sometimes call his disciples children. And that's what Jesus is doing here. And so this is a clue to the disciples that this might be their teacher. This might be the one discipling them. This might be Jesus. But they don't pick up on the clue. They don't get it yet. And so they answer him in verse 5. And they said, no. No, we haven't caught any fish. Verse 6 we read. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat. And you will find a catch. So they cast and when they, were, when they were not able to haul it in because, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. This is clue number two. Jesus had given Peter and a few others of them a very similar command like this before. Back in Luke's gospel, early in Luke's gospel, early in Jesus' ministry, Jesus comes across Peter in, in Luke chapter 5. And listen to what Jesus says to Peter. Peter is out there fishing. And uh, it says in verse 4 of Luke chapter 5, when Jesus had finished speaking, because Jesus got out on a boat and was speaking to a crowd on, on land, he's, he's on this boat with Peter. He said to Simon Peter, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered him and said, Master, we worked hard all night and we caught nothing but I will do as you say, and let down the nets. When they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So, they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them, and they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord. For I am a sinful man. For amazement had seized him and his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not fear. From now on you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed Jesus. Well, now Peter has taken up his old his old occupation, after Jesus had uh, died on the cross and had been raised from the dead, Peter said, I'm going fishing. And we read again in John chapter 21 about Peter and the other six disciples that were with him in the boat and Jesus, this mysterious man on land, that Peter still had, did not figure out who this was. I like Peter because he's as clueless as most of us, you know? He didn't, he didn't really figure it out. We, we read this and we know who it is, you know. We've read the end of the book, as you might say, and we know who this is, but Peter didn't catch on. So we read in John 21, verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John talking about himself, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, in John's gospel, we have this incredible interaction between John and Peter. Uh, sort of, you see it sometimes all throughout the gospel, because it was at the Last Supper that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, as he describes himself, was leaning back as they were all reclining at the table for the Last Supper. He was leaning against Jesus' chest, and it was John who whispered in Jesus' ear, who is it? Who's the one that will betray you? And John receives the answer. And John was the go-between, between Peter and Jesus. And again here, John seems to be the go-between. Peter doesn't have a clue who it is, but John knows. And John says to Peter right there in the boat, That's the Lord. And so, in verse 7, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he Put his outer garment on, for he, had stri he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. Now, so Peter, 
wanted all the freedom of not being hindered by this outer garment. You could think of it as a big, like a bathrobe type of deal. You, you've seen the pictures of people in that day wearing the outer garments, the robes. He had taken that off so he could fish correctly. But now that he's about to jump into the lake and swim to shore, he puts the outer garment back on. And you might think, well, that's odd. Isn't that going to slow him down? Isn't that going to weigh him down? Yes, it will slow him down. Yes, it will weigh him down, except when you're you're a disciple of a rabbi, and especially when that rabbi is the Lord Jesus himself, you don't go to a meeting half naked. And so he put his outer garment on, jumped into the lake, abandoned the other six disciples, and swam to shore. And so in verse 8, we read, But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. So in that day, typically, when you have a fisherman out on the lake like that, you have two boats and they have the net connected to them. Peter's in the one boat being the experienced fisherman. The other disciples are in the small boat, But Peter abandons his boat, runs to shore, and now the other disciples are forced to bring all of this haul of fish to shore uh, by themselves. And so um, they not only had to pull all of this by themselves, but they had the the added weight of the fish. In verse 9, we read, So that when they got out on the land, they saw charcoal fire already laid, and fish placed on it, and bread. Now, they're all on the land. They all know that this is Jesus. But Jesus prepared a meal for them. Why? And we have a clue here that this is more than simply a meal just to eat, although it was that, as every meal is. But there's something deeper going on. And the clue that we read about in verse 9 is the charcoal. The charcoal fire is very, very important to this narrative. It is the clue. Because there's only one other place in the entire New Testament where charcoal is ever mentioned. And it's right here in the same Gospel of John, just a few chapters before For these disciples, it was only a few weeks before. For Peter specifically, it was only a few weeks before that he encountered a charcoal fire. And what happened on that event, on that night, was that the Last Supper had already happened. The Garden of Gethsemane had already happened. Jesus was arrested there in the garden. And he was being taken by the soldiers into the city of Jerusalem. And he was being taken to the high priest's house. When when you think about a house, I don't want you to think about your house or my house or anything like that. The high priest had a compound. It was a large, large building with many different areas to it. And so this is where Jesus was being taken. And we read in John's Gospel that Peter was following along. Not too close, because he might get arrested too, and not too far away, because you might lose the target, and that is to follow Jesus. But he's following along at a safe distance, and Jesus is taken into the high priest's house, and Peter goes as far as he can. He makes his way into the court of the high priest, the outer court of of the high priest, And so the only people that are there that we know of in the outer court of the high priest are the high priest slaves, the high priest officers, and Peter. Peter's sticking out like a sore thumb. And as soon as he begins to talk, they realize he ain't from around here. And so Peter's a little bit out of place. And it's cold that night. It's the middle of the night. It's very cold. And all of the slaves of the high priest and the officers of the high priest and Peter stand around and they warm themselves by a fire, a charcoal fire. 
And it was while Peter was standing with the others by the charcoal fire that he denied knowing Jesus. He denied being one of Jesus' followers. He denied being Jesus follow, a follower of Jesus not just once, not just twice, but three separate times, just like Jesus predicted. You know how your sense of smell brings back memories? I mean, if you smell the right type of cookie, in your mind, you're taken back to Grandma's kitchen, aren't you? Every time I smell the distinctive smell of diesel bus fumes, I'm taken back in seventh grade to Colorado where I'm holding my skis on the ski trip, and I'm walking past a, bu past a bus, and it belches all of this black diesel smoke right in my face. I always remember that when I smell diesel fumes. We know scientists tell us that the sense of smell and the part of the brain and the memory are right there connected to one another. Now, when Peter, going back to Peter, when he was on the boat, he may have been slow to recognize the Lord. He had to be told. And he jumped out of the boat and he swam ashore. And now Jesus is very, I think, intentionally making a meal with a charcoal fire. Why? Why is Jesus making a charcoal fire knowing that it's going to trigger a memory from Peter just a few weeks before, if that, of a very painful event in Peter's mind? Why would Jesus intentionally bring back such a bad memory for Peter? I mean, it has to be intentional, right? Verse 10 of John 21, all the disciples, the seven disciples and, and Jesus are there. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Jesus had his own fish, but bring some of the fish which you had, have now caught. Verse 11, Simon Peter went up and he drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. All, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Well, a couple of things here. Number one, I'm not sure why Peter was the only one who had to drag all these fish up to land, but I've got an idea. My, my thought, it's speculative, is that the other disciples were not real pleased with Peter abandoning them with all the fish in the ocean, in the sea, in the lake, really. And uh, when Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've caught, they all looked at Peter and said, get to it, son. And Peter had to do it himself. And Peter dragged all of these fish up onto the land. And it had to be quite a chore, quite exhausting. And again, this is speculative. But I think John, probably having some fun with Peter, said to Peter, Hey, Peter, how many fish do we have? And Peter, being exhausted, said, 153. And he threw out a number. Now, maybe Peter counted them. And there's all types of theories as to why John would include in his gospel specifically 153. What does that mean? 153. And you have biblical num numerologists who try to figure out these numbers. You know, 153. What does that mean? And I've read all these commentaries and websites and everything else, and there's just not, not really a good solution. The best solution is, I think it's even pretty far out there, is that if you take the number one, and you were to build a triangle to have the number one right there. And then the next row, you have two digits, two and three. The next row, you have three digits, four, five, six. The next row, you have four digits. And so every single part of this triangle, like a bowling alley, bowling pins, you add an additional digit. By the time you get to the 17th row, the last number is 153. Ooh, what does that mean? I have no idea what it means. And the best theory about what that means is that on the 17th row, well, you take the perfect number 7 and the perfect number 10, that adds up to 17, and so somehow this is perfect. I have no idea. That's the, the solutions for why there's 153, I think, are really poor. I don't know why. So my theory is Peter made up a number. And John 
writing scripture accurately recorded this number that Peter gave. And then John added a little statement here where he said, And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Because what happened back in Luke chapter 5 when Jesus told them to uh, cast the net into the sea, they had so many fish and that net was torn. I think maybe, just a theory, very speculative. John is poking fun at Peter's exaggeration as a fisherman. And that maybe there really literally was 153. But all we know for certain is that John recorded that accurately. So who knows why there's 153, but we do know this. Peter by himself had to drag all those fish up to, up to shore. We read in verses 12 and 13, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. I love the mental imagery that we have here of a group of eight men sitting around a fire, eating what nature, what the Lord had provided for them that day. And one of these men is Jesus. Can you imagine being a part of that small crowd, guys, being able to sit around a fire with Jesus. What would you talk to him about? Well, they were there with the Lord. Verse 14. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Verse 15 begins this way. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, Jesus is not saying, do you love me more than you love these other disciples? He's not saying that. He's specifically asking Peter, I think in front of everybody, Peter, do you love me more than they love me? That's the question here. Do you love Jesus more than others love Jesus? Verse 15, Jesus asked that question and Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my lambs. Now, Jesus is starting to do something very difficult for Peter. Jesus is doing a little bit of surgery on Peter's spiritual heart. You see, Peter, even at this point, had a high opinion of himself. He believed himself to be the epitome of loyalty and devotion. None of the other six jumped in the ocean to go see Jesus. Peter did, though. None of the others cut off the high priest slave's ear. Peter did. None of the others said, we're not going to let you die. But Peter spoke up. Peter considered himself to be the epitome of loyalty and devotion, yet it was Peter who had denied Jesus three times. And so Jesus needed to do, to do a little bit of surgery on Peter's heart. Now, this has been a very difficult year for a lot of people. There's been COVID, high unemployment. There's been racial unrest in our country, seemingly unrest and discomfort all around the world. But I, I want to tell you about something that uh, I suffered through personally. Just this past week, I got a splinter in my thumb. Oh, man. I know. It's rough. But I had a, I had a splinter deep in my thumb. And you know, when you get a splinter in your thumb, you're, you're left with one hand to get it out. And it's hard to see sometimes uh, and hard to dig into it. And so I, I called for my wife to come help, and she was glad to come do surgery on me. And I held the flashlight, and she started digging and digging. And it was so painful, incredibly painful. But you just sort of suffer through it. And she was digging and digging, and, and we think she got it out. It, 
took two times, two separate days, to try to dig this thing out. But it was painful. But that's what surgery is when you don't have an anesthetic. And Jesus was doing some surgery on Peter's spiritual heart. And there wasn't an anesthetic for Peter. Peter had to go through the pain that Jesus was causing him right here. Every time Jesus asked this question, do you love me? It cut Peter's heart. Every single time. But sometimes you can't get to the root of the problem until that surgery takes place. And so Jesus asked Peter a second time in verse 16. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, shepherd my sheep. Peter gave essentially the same response as before. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. But Jesus wasn't through probing. Because based on Peter's response, Peter wasn't cut to the quick deep enough yet. In verse 17, Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? This third time did it. Because we read, Peter was grieved because Jesus said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. You know, between the smell of that charcoal fire bringing back the memory of what had happened probably not even two weeks before, and Jesus asking him three times the same question about whether he loved Jesus. By now, Peter could not escape the obvious connection that Jesus was making with Peter's denials of him. But Jesus was not angry at Peter. Jesus expressed no disappointment in Peter. Jesus was not livid. Jesus did not feel betrayed. Jesus simply loved Peter. He simply was restoring Peter. And not only was Jesus restoring Peter, but Jesus was also empowering Peter for ministry. Tend my lambs. Shepherd my sheep, tend my sheep. Why in the world did Jesus force Peter to go through such a painful ordeal and remember the denials that he had made? Why in the world has God allowed a pandemic to come and affect all of our lives to the point where many of us had Thanksgiving essentially alone and not with extended family, where many of us have had to pray for and weep for and bury people who have been affected by this pandemic. Why does God ever allow us to go through the most painful ordeals that we have to go through? Here's the reason. Being a follower of Jesus is more than simply sounding off or spouting off superficial answers. It is not enough for Jesus for us to simply say, Yes, I love you. Jesus is going to probe deeper. He's going to probe deeper. He's going to go deeper, spiritually doing surgery on your heart, wanting to know if the truth will actually come out. Do you really, truly, when I put you through the pain, love me? 
If you want to follow Jesus, then he gets access to the depths of your heart that you don't want anyone to go to. Jesus gets to go there. He gets to dig there. He gets to expose the viruses, the maladies, the cancers, spiritually speaking, that you have in your heart. But if you're willing to suffer the penetrating gaze of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you're willing to go through the pain of spiritual surgery that Jesus requires of his disciples, as he probes the depth of your soul, then he will fully forgive you and restore you. And not only restore you, he will prepare your life for ministry to other people. Because it was this same Peter going through this difficult encounter with Jesus who would later write, in the first book that bears his name, in chapter 5, to a group of pastors. And he would say, to shepherd the flock of God among you. The one who had to be told to tend and to shepherd the lambs and the sheep now was the one telling others to do the same. Because now he was prepared, as someone who had been through the fire, to put others to the test. Jesus loves you too much to leave you alone. He will restore you, as painful as it may be. He will restore you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the restorative ministry of Jesus We thank you even for the pain that we go through as we grow in our faith in Christ. We know that the trials that come into our lives sometimes come directly from your hand, and sometimes they're, they seem to be just the common trials of life. But Father, every difficulty we encounter is a test. It's a test of our faith to see if we will continue to be thankful to you for all things, continue to love you through all challenges. And Lord, I thank you that Jesus himself is our model, that his love is a perfect love that we try to attain. Help us, Father, even though we are sometimes weak to love the Lord Jesus more today than we did the day before. It is in his name we pray. Amen.